Hello, everybody. Miles Kessler here, and welcome to the first in our series of uh, Dharma discussions or Aikido discussions on the topic of Aikido and non-duality. This is a series of, uh, of, uh, of Aikido discussions that I'm going to be doing with, with several teachers throughout the year. Um, I'm doing a bunch of events around the topic of Aikido and non-duality this year. The first one is, is, is going to be kicked off in, in Memorial Day weekend. 2019 uh, in Roseville, California, and I'm very happy to be teaching with the same man that I am actually on the call with today, uh, Dan Masisco Sensei, and uh, and Dan's been in Aikido for quite some time. I think that uh, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to call you an old timer, but but um, even though you and I are somehow kind of, I think rank wise, number wise, we're, we're are you still sixth on, Dan? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so we're the same rank, but but. I'm not eligible to 2023 if I'm still alive, you know. So, <laughs> okay. all right. <laughs> but what was I going to say? I was going to say we're the same rank, but Dan's a whole generation ahead of me in Aikido, so uh, numbers can be deceiving. Anyways, I'm very happy to uh, to to invite you uh, to welcome you to the call, Dan. How are you doing? Good. Yeah. Let's see, I got a small gallery here. Let's see if I can make it bigger here. Let's see. Switch to active speaker. No, no. I just leave it alone. I guess that's it. It'll probably automatically. Yeah. Uh, I hear people sort of clicking on, but I've only got like nine people. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, Dan. Since since we didn't, um, since since I'm not going to re really do an introduction for you today, because we've you know we met before on these calls, um, and our the topic that we're going to be working with is Aikido and non duality. And to be honest, you know, this for me and I don't want to you know not this doesn't say anything about what people are teaching or not teaching in Aikido, and may or may not say they're teaching or whether they can do it or not. But I look at your Aikido, and I've read some of your 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 words, and I and I see a total congruency there. And actually, this, uh, for my opinion, you're one of the few people in the Aikido world that actually um, has a little bit of an understanding on this. Not that there aren't great Aikido teachers out there doing great stuff, but Aikido and non-duality. Um, so maybe, can you tell me a little bit about your story and how you came to this, uh, this discovery of Aikido and non-duality? Uh, yeah, before I do that, I think uh, it's, it's important that, uh, you know, I think uh, non-duality can be experienced. Uh, yeah. Talking about it is, is difficult, as you probably it's, know with your studies. It's tricky, yeah. It's, uh, it, uh, because we can put non or un on the beginning of any word, you know. Mm -hmm. I like to, another word I use for non-duality is absolute, the absolute. And right. you can say, well, the unabsolute, if you, people want to argue, right? So yeah, when, we're yeah. talk, when we're talking, there's always a difficulty explaining things because duality can't be expressed in words. It can be experienced, right. you know, as a reality. And uh, I remember I was a, an art major in high school. And I was really fascinated by the uh, primary colors and all the different color wheel, you know, the color wheel, the things you can do. Right. And, you know, the teacher would say, well, you know, the primary colors are, uh, was it blue, uh, yellow, and uh, red. And mm. so I was really excited. I said, well, I'm going to make white because they're all products of white by mixing those three together. And, of course, you don't get white. You get dirty yeah. purple, dirty brown, or some other yucky color. Yeah. And I asked the teacher about that. And she says, well, you have to understand, these paints are not color. They're pigments that absorb certain wavelengths and reflect mm. them. You know, so what you're seeing is reflected. When you see red, you're seeing all the other colors that, you know, the other colors are absorbed and red is reflected. So we're seeing the light bouncing off into our eye, which sees red. Mm, <laughs> and right. uh, so this is a, and uh, if you sort of look at, uh, in, in duality, we have, let's say, white and black. And, uh, Black is not really a color. Black is the absence of color. You see, white is all colors, including, you know, I mean, actually all colors are called ultraviolet things we can't see, but black is the absence of color. And the only true black is a black hole, you know, where nothing gets right. out. Right. Okay. So the light, the light just goes in. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah, reflect. Exactly. Out, so right. this is kind of the problems with, as you probably experienced in meditation and what you've done, is you really can't put a you can't grab onto the ideal of non-duality. You can sort of skirt around it. Yeah. You can skirt yeah. around and say, well, it's not this, and it's not this, and it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So uh, okay, let's bring us into the topic of, of uh, Aikido and the way I, that I look at it in my training. Uh, somewhere in my training along the way, I, uh, uh, I find myself sort of unhappy with what I was doing, and in a sense also with what I was being taught. Mm. And uh, it's, or it's, Aikido wasn't living up to my dream. 
I had this vision of Aikido and I really didn't know exactly what it was, but I, it wasn't really what I was experiencing or training. There right. still seemed to be a competitive element to it, the winners and the losers. And, we, you know, there's a lot of talk in Aikido, well, you know, it's harmonious and it does this and that. And uh, so, you know, I didn't see those since I missed him by a couple of weeks, but I watched a lot of his videos and I would study them. And I saw something different about the way he moved. And it's as if he was moving in his own universe, his own place. And other, everybody else was moving in another one. So he, he wasn't mm. interacting directly with people, but sort of moving outside of it. And I always say he was outside the matrix. You know? Right. right. And, and so I started to look at my own Aikido and think, well, what is it? What causes the duality? What causes this thing? And it begins at the very beginning of, uh, of the way that we approach it. And I'll be able to explain this as a, you know, as a real thing in the, in the training this, uh, this month. But we start off and we match up with a partner. As soon as we match up with a partner, that's duality. There's two people there. Right? Mm. And so our perspective, I call it a relative's perspective, is, okay, I'm dealing with this person. This is my uke. How am I going to harmonize with them? How am I going to blend with them and resolve this conflict? That's beautiful, but it's still all in the world of duality. It's still, it's still interacting yeah. with that one person. And yeah. so from the very beginning, what I try to teach in my classes is that the most important thing that I can show my students, the most important thing that I can pass on is how you start. And you have to start with an absolute perspective, mm. which means that as you are standing there in the center of everything, you're in the center here, uh, you can no longer use, in the absolute, with the absolute perspective, you, ne you never use the everyday descriptions of the interaction with the person that's in front of us. The very words in front of us already creates duality. So there's no to the left, to the right, behind, or in front of your uke. You're in the center, and you're here. Here is the center. And the only place you can go to is here. There is no there. Uh, there, here and there is part of the duality. So when mm. I'm here, and I move my body, I take the here with me. Wherever I go, here goes with me. Mm. And uh, the... What happens when I do that is when the UK is encountering coming towards me, instead of them thinking that he's going to reach a certain way, I'm moving in this other place that's my reality. And they are sort of pulled into this kind of, uh, I call it the attractive force. They get pulled yeah. into the kind of field around me. And like I said, I can, only, I can talk about, but you, you have to experience it. And the yeah, people I, I, who practice me, they feel it. They say, my God, I came at you and suddenly I'm falling into a hole. Yeah. And you're in the center and everything. I always find myself on the outside of that. So you actually have to, as you practice, you have to have content, keep that attitude of that you're always in the here now, constantly. And so it's a full-time job. It really is. I'm here and it's now. And then as you move around the mat, you're always in that here and now. You're not going anywhere. In fact, the first interaction that we have is ourselves in the earth. That's the first duality. That's the first dualistic relationship. So if you stand on the earth and you move around the earth, you're already caught. I've often described what I do as moving on earth as you would in space. And that means that... Which after all, the earth is already moving in space anyways. Exactly. <laughs> so if you imagine yourself floating in space out there and you really all you can basically do is change the shape of your body. So if you wanted to get into Seiza, I've said this before, you have to create Seiza in space, which is totally different than creating Seiza on Earth. Uh, if you want, on Earth, we can go down. In space, you can't go down. You can assume what would be called a down position, in other words, knees up to chest, right? Mm -hmm. But how would you do that in space? You bring your knees to your chest and your feet out flat. So let's say you're standing on the Earth and you go down. That's moving in duality. However, if you're standing on the earth and you bring your knees towards your chest, you'll still go down. But it'll feel different and it'll be different. Mm. And you won't, it'll feel like the earth came up, like it stuck to your feet. Mm. And so moving that way, it takes, you know, it really have to have a, first of all, you have to have, a, you really have to have embodied consciousness. You have to be really aware of where your body is. Mm. And all your moves have to come from the core and you have to move again, you can't think of going someplace or directions. You change the shape of your body. And by changing the shape of your body, things happen. You move across the earth. You, to other people, you go down. To other people, you get bigger or go mm -hmm. up. I would say I, I get bigger or, or I, I expand and shrink. Mm -hmm. 
uh, where I really saw this was in a video of Osensei when he's uh, demonstrating and uh, he has a group of people attacking the students. There's probably about 10 of them and they all mm. charge at him. If you look closely at that video, before they attack him, just as they get there, he extends his body, stretches out, and then he brings his knees up to his chest. And when, you, when he brings his knees up to his chest, of course, he goes down, right? If you look at it, you probably would think he's going down, but look closely and you'll see that he really brings his knees to his chest, which brings him down. So he's like leaped in the air, made himself smaller. And as he makes himself smaller, everybody goes onto the black hole. Mm. And then he expands himself and they explode off of him. Mm. So what looks like he's going down and standing up is really him shrinking and expanding in space. Now, probably from his perspective, that was, you know, that's the way he looked at things. I don't mm. know if he thought of it this way. And the way he moves is obvious when I see him moving on the mat. And not always. I mean, he screws up like everybody, right? We're all human. Sure. But as he moves around the mat, you tend to see him moving in his time and space, going to his place, turning in his space. And everybody sort of gets caught in this kind of a whirlwind around him as he does this. So this is my approach to the practice anyway. Yeah, and, and you know, in the, in, I'm, so I'm going to uh, always refer, re, not always, but I want to reference this to the spiritual traditions because all the spiritual traditions are looking at the absolute. Yeah. Usually one, two, three, or four different ways. It's still the same absolute, but, you know, like the different pigments of color, like you were saying. One of the one of the one of the uh, let's say the I guess if there was a formula you could say that the the the, the equation it, it equals uh, zero or it equals one and the zero would be the non self traditions where it's empty 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 and the one would be the the non dual traditions where it's where it's this kind of oneness thing and it's you know uh, it's my opinion and I could be wrong it was it's, but it's my opinion that Osensei's realization was of the of the non dual type rather than the non-self. Maybe he even had the, the two, but he was clearly expressing this kind of non-dual uh, non uh, 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 realization in the midst of conflict. And, um, uh, but I actually personally, you know, oh, by the way, and the non-self the non school is, is t tends to be a gradual development. In other words, you do years of preliminary practices and you go through these stages, you go through those stages, you go through those stages until you have a realization. Whereas the non-dual schools are, are these, they're, they're called the sudden path, the sudden schools, the direct. You know, and that's, sim that's very similar to what you're, you're, you're teaching the non-dual, you're teaching this kind of whatever, right from the beginning. And um, I'm curious, how did you come to that? Because nobody's teaching that in Aikido. None of, none of that first generation, I shouldn't say none, but from yeah. what I know, None of the 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 the, the well-known teachers of that of that second generation or the first generation after Osensei, there were teachers that, that were talking about spirituality, even teaching spirituality, but nobody was teaching really what you were talking about. And I'm I'm curious, how did you come yeah. to this in your, in your own training? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was just uh, like I said, I was I was looking for something in Aikido, and I had done Tang Sudo for an Aikido together, uh, karate, and. Uh, when I was uh, training in uh, uh, Korea, watching the master and his son practice and the way that they interacted, is they didn't, you know, you see, again, we're talking about you take the master, his son, then you got all the deshi after that. None of them mm -hmm. were doing what they're doing. Yeah. And uh, again, it was a feeling that when I would punch at one of them, they didn't block. They moved in a space again, that kind of weird space, and they morphed into a shape. So right. from, instead of blocking, they would just morph into a space in, mm -hmm. out of the line of attack. And I right. find myself that, that sort was, of- it was, appropriate, it was appropriate with your, fit, your, your punch yeah. in a way. Exactly, there, yeah. was never, there was always this kind of morphing. It's the way it always seemed like yeah. there was this, they were a certain way, and it wasn't like, bam, like this, they were here, and then they were here. They were here, and they were here. They were kind of morphing, and that looked totally different than everything after that. All the Taekwondo and Tang Soo, you see, everybody is blocking and kicking and punching and interacting that way. And I think it's human nature to do that. I mean, we grow up in the world of duality as we interact that way. And, uh, you know, we have a conversation. I can sit and right now I'm having this dualistic relationship with the, with the uh, screen, mm. and now I can change that. And it's not much of a change, but suddenly I'm sitting in this chair, and the room's all around me, and there's the screen in that, and now I'm in the center. And it's just, boom, like that, the attitude's mm -hmm. different, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, 
the frustration and the disappointment that I have is that I have to bring this state on. I have to induce it. Okay. It's not my everyday state. And when I you say think, induce it, it's just a matter of, of, of intentionally shifting, like yes, you just did. Yes, I have to yeah. shift. And you know, that shift is going to depend on the, the dramatics of the situation, how intense it is. <laughs> I sure. mean, I can get on the mat and I can do things, you know, that people go, wow, how in the world did you do that? Right. And suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm attacked by two guys with axes and I'm running and screaming, you know, I mean, this yeah, is the frustration for me is I'm not naturally in that state. Right. And the, the situation outside of my, cult, my peaceful, you know, world I'm in, uh, I can do this because of practice. And, you know, and the dojo is a great place. I know I, I walk on the sure. mat and wow, I've got it. But, and not uh, only not only that, not only that, you could also say that the frustration is for the dualistic self, because once yeah. that shift happens, I mean, frustration might be a part of the space, might be part of the, the constellation, but it's not really a problem. Yeah, and so it's a, it, it is a problem, and also in teaching it, there's a, there's a difficulty too, because I can mm -hmm. go out there and I can show people what I'm doing and explain it, and I've got I've developed a thousand analogies to help people to feel it, and I get people yeah. doing it. Yeah. And they'll go, well, yeah, I know what you mean, I know what you mean. But, you know, the difficulty that I have keeping it with years and years of doing it, right, I can answer frustration of somebody who's just sort of getting a taste of it and then immediately forgetting it, you know, a few seconds later. You yeah. Know. After years of long-term commitment to martial arts and IQ, not to mention other martial arts, yeah. but also... Yeah, very know. easy to slip back into. And I noticed that I'm much better, better at maintaining this state, this absolute perspective, as a teacher than as a student. And you see what happens in the, I'm in the class, I'm in the center, I'm on stage, you know, I'm in the center here, I have this feeling of being there. And then all of a sudden I'm the student and the teacher's in the center and I'm with my partner and I'm saying, okay, you wanna try that? You see <laughs> <laughs> what happens? <laughs> totally. As as I slip yeah, into totally. that, you know, he, the teacher's the center and I'm the student and this is my partner, I'm already, trapped in it and I come you know yeah. and I get awkward and clumsy and nothing works and I go oh. and then I'll say wait a minute and then I'll just suddenly regroup and I'll go okay I'm still in the center even though the teacher's in the center and his center I'm still in the center and that person's in their center everybody's in their center I don't have to be pulled into this you know this a relative relationship right. you know I'm letting myself be pulled into it you know that I can maintain that feeling uh, so that when the class starts, let's say I'm in the class and I'm doing warm-ups, now what I do, instead of watching the teacher and doing the warm-ups, I'm in the center doing the, I see him do it, but I do the warm-ups in the center of the room. Mm. And uh, so I start right from the beginning. So that helps me. And then when I practice for the first time, I don't say, okay, let's practice. I just keep that feeling. And I can still talk and say, okay, let's start. But I keep that feeling like I do what I'm teaching while I'm in the center. Yeah. And then yeah. it works really well. But again, that's the dojo environment. You step out of life and I come home to my wife and my kids and my dog and I'm lost in samsara, you know? What can I say, you know, I'm just lost, you know, in every day. Is that the right term, samsara? Every day totally. life. Yeah, 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 samsara yeah. in the Indian, I think it's a- uh, the, the, the wheel of suffering, the wheel of, the yeah. endless wheel of birth and death. I'm just here, I'm, you know, this is it. I'm just sort of in yeah. all this stuff. And then yeah. I'll be walking the dog and I go, oh yeah, and, oh, and there I am, and I got it again. Mm. You know, yeah. Or I'm driving Uber, you know, and I'm like doing this, and all of a sudden I go, "Oh wait, yeah, okay, yeah." I'm in the center, and the car's wrapped around me, and suddenly it's there again. I'm hoping my, i in my life, what I've how things how things are learned is sort of like this. It's the way that uh, uh, if you have a you know, an atom and you have the uh, nucleus, the neutron, you have the electrons going around that you pump mm -hmm. energy into it. You know, the electrons don't suddenly go into the next, you know, variance, whatever the valence is called. Right. right. Yeah. They, yeah. Uh, they leap. It's called a quantum leap. Yeah. Boop, they leap into the next one. And then all of a sudden, yeah. the energy gets to a certain level and they leap. And I think the way that we develop is the same way, is that we, we're doing this thing over and over and over again. All of a sudden, wham, and we go into the next oh, level. Just like that. Just like that. Yeah. yeah. The quantum and we leap. Can, and we can shift out of it just like that as yeah. well. And so, so it's very much. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please. Uh, and usually it's preceded by not this great feeling of what's going to happen. It's just preceded in frustration and unhappiness and like, I suck, you know? Mm -hmm. And you're really working this one thing and you're wearing it out and you're wearing it out and you're wearing it out and all of a sudden you go, oh, it sucks. And for some reason about that whole surrender is that thing that triggers you into that next level where it's a fresh beginning. Oh my God, I've got this great vision of my kid. I can't wait to share it. And you know, you work that for a while. 
So my frustration now with the fact that uh, I'm in and out of the state, you know, maybe I've got to work it long enough that somehow, maybe it'll never be a permanent state. Maybe, maybe you know more about Zen. You know, I've always thought that once you have enlightenment in Zen, you're, yeah, I'm home free now. But I've heard that, no, you still got to go and sit every day. You still yeah. got to do the same thing. It's yeah. kind of like, oh my God, I didn't think that was going to be it, you know? And again, I'm not, I don't know from experience is that, mm -hmm. you know, you sit Zen forever, you know? And uh, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe that's it. Maybe you just practice forever and don't worry about that there's this day when I will be in the absolute all the time, except probably when I die. You know, that's, that's a given, I think. <laughs> you know, we, we return well, to the source. I mean, but that's what it is with, you know, because I was thinking, speaking about these two approaches, which also are two schools. If you look at all the spiritual schools, sure. there's, this, uh, there's the gradual development school where you spend years developing practices and techniques and methods. And like in Aikido, the, the Q ranks and you get the, the sure. shodans. And ideally, as your skill set goes, uh, grows, so is your uh, psychological maturity and your spiritual maturity. Ideally, of course, that's not always the case. But then there are the sudden schools. And the, and the sudden schools are very much what you're talking about. It's the shift has to happen, and it and it can happen out of anything. You know, it, it just happens. It's kind of grace, but there's nothing that you can do to make it happen. So this kind of gradual developmental, even if it's a spiritual practice, it it can prepare you more, but it will never get you there. Yeah, it's very much like you can't get there from here, but if you get yourself right, then as you said, he there comes over here. Is it, yeah. you're, There's you're a like, beautiful line from uh, Jonathan Lemieux and Siegel. I don't know if you remember the book. You read the book. Of you know? course, sure. Yeah. And uh, I really love this line where, you know, the, the old master Chang, wherever his name is, you know, and mm -hmm. here's old Jonathan trying to says, okay, here I am. I'm going to go to that pinnacle. Over there now. And, he, and nothing mm -hmm. happens. He keeps trying mm -hmm. over. And he's so frustrated. He gives up. And then the master comes up and says, Jonathan, you can't get, that's not the way you get there. You have to, to go to anywhere, anytime. You have to begin by realizing you're already there, mm -hmm. which is here. You know, and that to get there, you have to be, you have to understand what here is. Right. And this is what I feel this, what I'm doing is like that. What I'm looking for is here. And I don't do just in the physical sense, but Aikido is here. You know, I've, all, I've come to believe there's no such thing as doing Aikido. You know, mm. I've been doing what, it'll be 55 years soon. And I can't Aikido anyone. It's impossible. You know, there is a, there's some changes going on in me that I'm becoming ikeified. My body is becoming has this ike mm -hmm. weight to it, or kind of a presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. That uh, and uh, this is this is where the work's going on. Is any changes I have to make have to be with me, my my you know perspective, the way I look at things, the way I interact with things. And uh, there's nothing I can do out there that's going to make it happen. You know, yeah. and uh, this sort of a putting the energy into this here is going to get me there is you know, that kind of there that doesn't exist, you know, because there here is everywhere. And now is always, I mean, you know, I'm amazed in science. I love science. Right. And I'm amazed. I read this. I saw this big article about time and the flow of time and dividing time. I said, I, these are scientists. Are they so blind that they can't see that you can't time isn't something that moves. There's only now. And, you know, there's only a, you know, it's like time is just a, a measure of change in the ever present now. So we measure change mm. and we say, well, that's yesterday and today, but no, it's just eternal now. Mm. Yeah. And we, if we measure the change, we can say time's going by, but basically mm. it's always now, always has been now, always will be now. And yet these scientists are sitting there dividing up, making layers of time. And there's this time behind and this time in the future. And it's just like, I just go crazy because these are great scientists. Right. And yet, would you say that there's a place for that? In the human mind, because that's how the human mind does. And again, when we get into the mind, we start to cut things up and, 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 and measure it, you know? Okay, and, but, uh, we do, we, but we've done that in Aikido too. We've, we've, we've got all these categories of techniques, et cetera, styles, whatever. Is there a place for that? I think there is, because so, you have somewhere along the line, you got to keep people busy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> sure. It's like little yeah. kids, you, know, you give them a little tour. I mean, look at kids' classes, it's perfect, right? Yeah. I mean, the games they play, right? Is that really Aikido? But it's, they enjoy it. And in the context of those games that they're playing, mm -hmm. IQ principles can come out if you're a good teacher, right? Mm -hmm. It's not right. just games. But you, right. you just can't say no games. Okay, kids, sit down. Here's what the universe, you are one, you're one with the universe. Okay, you got it. You know, it doesn't work. And it's the same mm -hmm. when, I, when I lead a class. I realize, you know, you know, where I come in best for teaching is actually in seminars. And in everyday 
situation, what I do here in Roseville is basically that we call it a, uh, a, a laboratory night. Jeff and I teach a class each. And it's yeah. basically people come there looking for something outside of their everyday practice in that class. It's sort of a lab that we look at things. And, uh, but if I were just to bring people in raw, like out of, you know, with no IQ at all in that situation, it's really, it's almost impossible to just sort of start, I need something to work with, you know? Yeah, right, right. It's sort of like, you know, they've worked on this product for a long time and I'm just gonna do the kind of fine little adjustments to it, you know, just the, the fine tuning of it. And uh, sort of like that. So, well, I mean, there's, but there's that double-edged sword because, you know, you invest a lot of time and energy and ego, frankly, into developing a skill set. It can actually make it more difficult than, it, than if you were a beginner to make that shift. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it should be one way or the other. You know, per, personally, I like my, my meditation practice, my spiritual practice. I always followed the gradual schools. And I've, I'm deeply impacted by the sudden schools, you know, the non-dual yeah. schools. And, and same thing with Aikido. I've, I've, fo I've followed this gradual path. And like you, I started to kind of get a little bit, I didn't get frustrated, but I started a little bit frustrated thinking, you know, I, I'm, I don't feel like I'm getting any closer to what I, what was, what I felt was calling me. And I look yeah. around at all my teachers and, you know, wonderful people and, you know, great Aikidoka, but also didn't see them also getting any closer, really, fundamentally to this kind of, this call that Doro Sensei was somehow uh, uh, whispering in my ear. Um, and um, so there's that, there's that, there's that dilemma, you know, the, and so it's like, it's clear that the gradual approaches won't get you there, but they can prepare you for making that shift if you're not too attached to them. You're right. And I think the thing is, when I look at, you know, what goes on, I look at, uh, for example, I would look at some of the Taekwondo schools and I think my years ago, I say, oh my God, they don't understand. They're doing it wrong. You yeah. know, and I see the smiles on the kids' faces when they got their belts and the, and the, and the, mm -hmm. and the happiness in the parents. So I says, does it matter? <laughs> you, know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, you know what I mean? And, and so when I see practice, I, I mean, there's wonderful practice out there. I'm, I am fascinated by the practice in Europe. And I watch some of those teachers over there. What's mm -hmm. going on? I mean, is it uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bruno Gonzalez, you know? Oh, my mm -hmm. God. Beautiful, you know? And there's yeah, another yeah. Greek teacher. I think they're all part of a, either Indo or TSA school. And the way they move is so beautiful. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I realize Uki and Nagi work together in that, you know, to make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. And, you know, and I can't touch that. I mean, that is just incredible. And yet when I watch it, from my perspective, I still see, you know, it's still one-on-one. -on -one. It's like, uh, it's like you see... It's still uh, dualistic. It's still dualistic. Yeah. So you see, let's take dancing, right? You see two great uh, tango dancers, right? Or two great uh, professional dancers. And mm. some of them you'll look at it and they work beautifully together. It's a perfect fit, right? And then you'll see some of them out there that when they're dancing... You could take away the other dancer and it's still beautiful. They don't need the other dancer for it to be beautiful. Together, they're double beautiful. But if you separate them, they, they go 20 feet apart and they're moving still, you still see this kind of connection, but it's not this connection. The connection is to a greater connection. Yeah. And this, I think, is in Aikido too. There's this, there's beautiful Aikido that's in harmonious and connected and it's all in the world, the relative world of Aikido. And mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And there's this other thing that it's beautiful in its own way, but it's not dependent on those two people working together. And you don't need those two to make it beautiful right. and, uh, and, and centered. So there's this way of moving where that instead of harmonizing with your partner, you're harmonizing with the all. And when you're in harmony with the all, you're in harmony with everybody. You're in mm -hmm. harmony with the really great UK and you're in harmony with the, with the UK who's not so skilled. You're in harmony with the uh, person who's attacking with violence in mind because you've, great, you've, you've, you've harmonized with the greater harmony. Though, as those senses say to be one with the universe, this is a greater harmony. And uh, not an easy thing. And not everybody needs this, you know? I mean, a lot of people are going to spend their entire life doing Aikido in the relative world with the duality there and be totally happy and just have a great time and, and be satisfied. Mm -hmm. So it's not like everybody has to get on board with this ideal. But for yeah. some of us, you know, you get to a point in your training, you say, is that all there is? Is that what I signed up for? Is, was this the original dream when I first, you know, well, wanted to do Aikido, you know? Well, that's the question that came to me. Even though, and, and it, came, it, it came to me in the midst where I was still very satisfied with what I was doing. And I had lots to learn. You know, I, I could see that there, I, I hadn't hit the ceiling. There was more to learn and, and more improvement to do and, 
you know, I was, I was in Japan at the time and actually I had been training about five years pretty intensively mm -hmm. and really climbed the, the, the hierarchy and, um, but at the same time, I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied. I said, well, okay, well, I could see, and my knees were starting to fall apart. And I could see that this was not sustainable that, you know, oh, that was, that was it. I knew that if I stopped, I was good because I was training like a maniac. If I stopped training, I would go down. Sure. I was like, well, there's gotta be something else that, that there's gotta be a shift there. And um, that was just the beginning of my own search. And, you know, and, and, but to be fair, um, uh, I wasn't really seeing too many, uh, uh, examples in the, the Aikido world that I was in. You know, I had a big network back in the States and, and yeah. a, a relatively bare, a comparatively bare, big network in the States and in, and in Japan as well. But I, but it became clear to me that I had to step out of it to, to, to find it. And I wasn't, it wasn't like I was stepping out of Aikido. I was just following that, that, that call. And that's why I went more deeper into a meditation practice and, and also, you know, working with other teachers on this very thing that we're talking about. Teachers that mm -hmm. had, have you ever heard of a guy named Peter Ralston? Yes. Yeah, yes. Peter. Peter's, Peter's tapped into book. amazingly. Yeah, yeah, and, and he he actually can do it. You know, he's very he's very much can do it. But he's still very much in the fighting world. But he has that 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 non dual thing that he was doing, and it's, it's through work with him that actually I started to kind of open up to it much much more. He had a bigger impact on my aikido than any of my aikido teachers. Yeah. And I only worked with him a little bit. I didn't I didn't really go into to his arts. But it was very much a sense of of um like you were saying. You know, you you. Okay, so maybe we can shift into talking about, about what does this non-dual perspective look like? How does it manifest when we're practicing? Because it's really not me doing twisting your arm and doing another technique to you. Yeah, again, you know those well, techniques that happen. Was a, they're talking about it, and you know, when I when I talk about when I'm doing it, people see it, and then I can talk about it while I'm doing it because it's you know they see the two together, that the action and, and the words come together. Uh, so what does but, it feel like? What does it feel like then? Well, it uh, basically, it starts, like I said, for me when I'm out there and I, 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 I'm talking to class and I call somebody up and they're standing there and I'll say, okay, I'll look at them. I'll say, well, you see, I'm out here and I'm in the center and you guys are here and he's here. But for me, everybody is sort of outside of, I'm still in the center. That's my first feeling. And so mm -hmm. the way that I present any movement at all, I mean, when the person approaches me, you know, we normally put our hand out, right, for them to grab. Well, I don't mm -hmm. do that. I pose in space which looks like I'm putting my hand out to grab them. Mm -hmm. I'm basically just creating a shape. And they come yes. to me, they always come to me. Yeah. And when they, as they come into that, they can either make contact or not make contact. I can just change that shape. And when I change yeah. that shape, they change. It changes them. It can change right. my body. So what I do, I call it this uh, Ike entanglement. Beautiful, entanglement, I love it, right? love it, love it, love it. Yeah, so it's Ike entanglement because what's happening, what I do to me, it happens to them. So if I go down, they go down. If I turn, they turn. If I walk, they walk. If I lift my arms, they go up. And because they're outside of the circle, it has a different effect on them. They're doing the same thing as me. But if I'm going down in the center and they're going around me and going down, you can see the dilemma they face. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're losing their balance, right? Yeah, at some, right. At some point, they have a choice to just kind of crumple up and fall or to take ukemi, you know, which we've learned that they can roll out of the loss of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the, uh, you know, I call it a, uh, it's sort of a fall from grace when we take Ukemi, you know, mm -hmm. we fall from grace. So we have this grace and so we lose that grace and fall, but at a very mm -hmm. high level, you maintain that grace. Yeah, you know? right. And yeah. Uh, so, but the way it feels is that, um, I, I, well, a couple of things, when they grab my wrist, right, I don't, I, I, I used to feel their fingers and feel their wrists and feel their bodies and feel their strength. And this, again, is in the world of duality, we, we, they look for that. Well, I want to connect with this person. I want to connect with their center, you know. But what I feel is my own body. So when they grab my wrist, I am aware of the bones, flesh, and blood of my own wrist and the hands mm -hmm. and everything. So everything that they do is outside of my body. And so I'm totally free to move the way that I want. And so I just move my body naturally, and they're just caught up again. So no matter how hard they grab, they don't get me. They can't get me. They right. can't, they, uh, there's not, because I get, the only way they can get me is if I give them me, by thinking of them, by thinking of their hand, by thinking of their thing. But I, I have a lot of, uh, 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 I've strengthened my uh, embodied consciousness a lot so that even though I'm touched from the outside, I still am aware of, of, of the meanness of it, you know, who I am. And when you're yeah. that, you're, you're free. You can just, it's very easy to move, you know. 
we trap ourselves. So it feels like, like that too. Or, or we, the uke, uke traps themselves in that case. In yes, this case. exactly, yeah. Yeah, they, get, yeah. they get caught and uh, so I'm free. So one of the exercises I do sometimes, I have people come up and push against my body, like get their bodies real close, like we're on an elevator. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. I do similar like, exercises. Oh my God, I can't move, yeah. I can't move. And then suddenly yeah. I'll say, but where am I? And I'll just relax and then be conscious of my own body. And suddenly they don't have me. And as I walk away, they come with me. I take the whole group mm. with me. So just that shift, it's always shifts in consciousness, you know? Well, you know, that's I, the, 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 for, in order for the Ike and so-called, what you call the Ike entanglement to happen, you have to make that shift. You have to make that shift. There's two things that go on. There's, there's a shift that mm -hmm. was the, the embodied consciousness. And then there's also an absolute perspective. No matter what happens, you have to be conscious of your own body. And the second thing is no matter mm -hmm. what happens, you're always in the center. Yeah. You're always in the absolute center. And no matter where you go or what you do, that never changes. Yeah. That's why you can't go down. If you go down, you've broken it. You're caught in and, and you, you'll be stopped. Right. But if you, if you imagine those same people sort of holding on to you or pushing against you and you relax, and instead of going down, you just in space, bring your knees up to yourself and make yourself into a cannonball in space. Mm -hmm. Imagine mm -hmm. what would happen to them. You see? Down, are, down, down happens. Down would happen, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. And so again, the, uh, in the relative world, we have these terms of down in front of, so when we talk, in, you know, in Aikido and the relative, I hear they talk about, okay, the safe spot, the safe spot, right? You know, you want to be in the safe spot. There's, the safe spot is everywhere when you're in the absolute. You're always in the safe spot. That's so awesome. Yeah, That's, I, right love it. I love the it. The other I thing is Kazushi, you know, to take the other person's center. No, there's, I, I don't ever take anybody's center. I maintain no, my own center. And then Kazushi happens. Kazushi happens. They right, make, yeah. you know, everything that happens to them is because of them, you know? Beautiful. So let's. So, so I want to go there, but I want to tell the people that are on the call. So if you anybody wants to jump in, you got questions for for Dan, or if you have a comment or whatever, um, raise your hand by going to the participants button at the below. We'll we'll see your hand on the side. I will come to you in just a moment. You can type a question into the chat. I'll also see it there. Definitely come in, ask a question. Uh, so let's go. Let's go to that point that you were just making, Dan. And uh, we'll talk for about another five ten minutes, and then we'll take questions. And sure. those questions come in sooner. Um, so, what does it require for uke? Uh, so, the, I, 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 just sure. Back, a package just came here. Okay. okay. Uh, you just the there. UPS man just showed up. <laughs> so, so, if this is if this is stimulating any any uh, thoughts or questions for anybody, definitely jump in. Feel free to to jump in and ask uh, either make a comment or ask Dan. Uh, sorry, yeah. my dog was attacking the delivery man there. Yeah, no problem. Okay. I used to I used to work for <laughs> UPS. I know yeah. how it is. Yeah. Okay. So then when I was saying, that, so this Ike entanglement, yeah, this, this beautiful shift, the, the, the two things, you have to be embodied somehow, conscious body, yeah. and then you have to uh, shift into the center. And then Ike entanglement will happen. But it does, there is a condition also from the Uke that yes. they have to give the right, they're, they're, they have to give input. They have to intent, they have to give input, yeah. Without that, continuous, have... continuous intent. Yeah. So if they, if they give intent and you start and, and, and things start to happen and then they freeze in space waiting to fall down, then there's no more need for Aikido because yeah. the, 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 the conflictual intent is over. Yeah, you know, it's really, it's difficult sometimes when someone just goes up and makes contact with you and then goes, okay, Aikido me. It's just, you know, I, I found myself in an impossible situation. It's a paradox, I can't, you know? And so the thing is, I think at the, at the very refined level of this, uh, uh, embodied consciousness, absolute perspective thing, that they never get to that point where, you know, they can really do the old, you know, Iwama lock on you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that right, at, yeah. at the very highest level, intent is just a thought. Yeah. The very thought. And again, you'd have to be very pure in this. You'd have to be yeah. very pure in your embodied consciousness and very pure with your perspective of the absolute uh, center. At the very highest level of this, even their intent is they're, they're, they get kind of pulled into it without realizing it. Oh, Just very totally. thought. Yeah, yeah. They get a, the attractive force kicks in. The yeah. entanglement. The yeah. moment there's the, I mean, without the intent to attack or to give energy or whatever you want to call it, without that intent, there's no, really no need for Aikido. There, it's yeah. not an Aikido uh, situation. But the moment sure. there's that intent, if you are, as you said, centered and and embodied, let's say, or a conscious body. Have you ever heard the story of old sensei before? And I don't know. Stories, you know, you hear them, you don't know if they're urban legends or not. 
I heard that a, uh, there was a, a kendo, a young kendo guy who he was a champion in Japan and he was, he could just stand there and instantly, boom, man, and he hit you and you didn't know what happened. He was so fast. He had this men, he'd go in and that's what yeah. he won all the matches with. It was just like, boom, it was a blur and people were standing there like, what, what happened? And they lost the match, right? And someone told him, you're really good, but you never hit O-sensei. And he goes, uh, well, I can hit anybody. It's a human, I can hit him. And so I guess he sent out a challenge, and O-sensei you know, said, I'm sorry, you know, he just ignored it or whatever. And so he kind of got pissed off, so he said he was going to go to Hambu Dojo. You know, so if I'm going to go there, I'm going to just walk in the door and uh, attack him and see what happens. And so he was a very controlled person. That's where he got his speed from. Mm -hmm. And uh, as he uh, – but he found himself as he, he told the story of what happened there. He says, as I was approached, as I started going towards the dojo, I found myself moving faster and faster and faster and faster. <laughs> and I, I said, I ran up the stairs and I just ran there, I ran inside there and I saw him and, I, and it's like he was waiting for me. I attacked him and then I was on the ground. <laughs> you, you see where the attractive force started. That's hilarious. As as oh my now, God. Again, this might be an urban legend, but I like the story. So it makes no difference. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's so beautiful. But the, 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 a lot of times stories, they don't have to be true for them to have meaning, right? They could be just like the Zen stories that somebody made up a long time ago, but they have a meaning behind them. And so I look exactly. at that and I said, you know, as soon as this person had the intent to attack him, it was like the penny that you drop into that little zzz. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Starts, right? And uh, so and, uh, and, it depends on how it's strong your attendance. You know? Well, not only that, when, 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 when you, as Uke, when, when you are in, the, are in this Aiki entanglement, your intent is it's it's allowed to fully um uh, go, to to be fully given in other yeah. words your your it goes fully it matures completely and then your role or your your uke your ukemi will be a result of that and you will feel like that's exactly what i wanted to do exactly you, you don't feel they disrupted like they're thrown. in fact they feel yeah. a lot of them don't know, have the sense of uh, you know of emptiness they're falling into a hole so, so there's a yeah. hole there and yet the hole is a safe hole it's yeah, only when right you too. panic there's not safe, yeah, so great. you know. It's so very, great. very safe. <laughs> so it's uh you know, I just uh uh you know it's uh, there's I mean it's so wonderful to practice that way, and that's why I'm trying so much to share it with people, you know. Mm -hmm. And it is difficult. I've come up with a lot of different methods and analogies and 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 things that we do every day to say, hey, we move this way anyway, we do this anyway. And uh, and I can see it happening, you know. In, at seminars or even in classes sometimes, but I also see people losing it very easily, you know, and, totally. and, and that's understandable, you know, to go right back or, to. Yeah. Or, or their, their taste of it or their connection with it is kind of dependent on being with you. Yeah. Cause you say you're in the center and people can, they can get into it and they can understand you. Also when I take Ukemi, you know, I don't, I don't resist people. When I take Ukemi, I give the people mm -hmm. intent. I give them full yeah. intent. I, you know, I have that continuous thing because I know what I, what needs to be given for them to understand it, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so if I stop and say, "Oh no, you're not doing it right," like that, you know, I just broke the intent, right? So I have to okay. take the full. I have to take the full Kimmy. I have to take yeah. the full Kimmy for them to feel it. So, and you know, it's mistaken for collusion a lot of times. You know, and she goes, "Oh, they're just doing this." Or you know, this you hear this with a lot of teachers. You know, it looks like collusion, right? And but you know, I mean, sometimes collusion is uh, there's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's also a path. You know, I mean, isn't every deshi devoted to a teacher? colluding in a way is that the right word colluding yeah yeah sure better, totally, better totally. Love for the teacher you know yeah, yeah. i mean From that's the outside it. It was... <laughs> yes yeah so you know when we dance we collude right <laughs> totally totally so you know you know there's just a big problem with aikido is a is this martial aspect that people are so hung up on but then that, 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 whole, thing. <laughs> that whole hang up you know, of aikido yeah. is and, you know, look, from, from my opinion, you know, Budo, Aikido, Budo is love. Now, what the hell does that mean? How can you, how can they, those two things occupy the same place at the same time? From a dualistic mindset, it can happen. But, you know, from a certain perspective, it can. It's true. But this whole idea where, where Aikido as a martial art has to be a martial art, which is a cool conversation. I don't have a problem with it. But it belongs on the dualistic side of the street. And it's never going to lead to love. You can't. It just can't, or the absolute, or oneness, or, or whatever else since I realized. It's a fine conversation. It may not be the best martial art on that dualistic line, but it, it's an okay conversation. It's just not going to lead to that, that, that place that is ultimately satisfying. You know, and a lot of times people don't realize the paradoxes of life. You know, for example, compassion is talked a lot about in Buddhism, right? But compassion really needs to start with loving yourself. Mm. And because... When you, can, when you really love yourself, that's when you have a compassion for who other people are, who are yourself. 
I experienced this the other day. I was looking, I was in the bathroom, you know, and I was brushing my teeth. And I was talking to my mom and dad because they died a few years back, not a few years, about 10 to years. I said, where are they now? Are they, do they exist? Is there anything I've left of them? Any of the, And I looked in the mirror and I saw myself and I saw my mom and dad looking back at me, mm. you know, and I really, yeah, they, I am them, you know, <laughs> I am their DNA, you know, and all the other DNA behind that. And then it just struck mm. me that, my God, I am everyone. And how can you not help have compassion for everyone when you love yourself and you realize that when you love yourself, you love everyone because everyone is you. It's kind of a selfish, egotistical thing. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the way that's maybe that's a problem i gotta I don't know, someday i'll be enlightened i'll love that person but you know if it's your child you can love them right if yeah you're, totally but then if everyone's I, your I'm, child and the greatest thing is everyone is you i mean what greater yeah. love is that right <laughs> yeah, yeah right exactly well listen dad we have a couple of questions here so maybe we'll sure. go over to uh to chris who's on his iphone uh chris i'm gonna open up your mic i think you're in the car hey chris how's it going it's going well. Thank you very much. I am in the car. Uh, yeah, welcome so welcome to the that. call. Uh, no problem. <laughs> I'm actually, Drive carefully, I'm please. At the beach. Uh, oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the Olympics. Uh, I'm on Whidbey Island in, in the Puget Sound. Um, but uh, what I really wanted to do was simply um, reinforce or support the inquiry that you're in and, and um, I guess verify with my own experience what uh, is being described, in, in particular what I'd call um, what you've called starting with the absolute, uh, but also the what I call the vortex that's created when I step off the line mm. into even even deeper presence than I started with. Mm. Uh, that creates a vortex that uh, they fall into, as you've described. It's absolutely mm -hmm. my experience, and it, it comes out of training with Moon over the years, who started with energy first, Aikido second. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Giawaza, then we can talk about Aikido technique as snapshots of what's going on inside the Giawaza. Mm -hmm. I, I won't um, prolong that, but I'd love to talk to you further, Miles, uh, about how this is showing up in the work I'm doing with leaders, essentially teaching this, this same consciousness shift into integrative unitive consciousness or unitive awareness. Beautiful. I'm also keying off uh, um, Peter Ralston, um, whom we had a chance to play with. So I just, this mm -hmm. is just a reinforcement, gentlemen. I, you know, right on is what I have to say. Mm -hmm. That's great, great. Chris, you training with, you're training with uh, Richard or you were, are you, um, are you I, teaching yourself? I could say I'm Richard's Daishi, even though I haven't okay. been uh, in California for 10 years. Wow. So I haven't hey. trained directly with Richard, but he and I talk all the time. He used to be my partner when we took this work into the wireless build out. Okay, beautiful. And, and you're, you said you're, you're, you're doing this work with, uh, in leadership as well? Yeah, I coach several leaders in this state shifting or uh, what I call uh, domain shifting capability mm -hmm. through the body, through mm -hmm. Aikido in slow motion. Mm. Uh, and, it, you know, I've, I've had a practice for 40 years in this work. And yeah. really, Moon and I got our start in the wireless industry where we were given carte blanche to develop this very capability in the leadership teams uh, in those companies. That's beautiful. Is there some place we can see your work online or uh, something? I've never published anything. I'll, I mm -hmm. can send you a couple of things, but I, I'm, <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've really been more about the, the lab that, that Daniel described, mm. um, that is experimenting. Rather than yeah. I haven't written anything up, I've just kept experimenting. Yeah, beautiful. Dan, do you, want to, do you have any comments? Uh, no, I think that uh, this is amazing about this. I think everybody sort of, it, somehow in our, in our life, we run across this absolute perspective, this uh, way of, we don't have to really sometimes even train it. It just happens to us. But then it sort of slips by us a lot of times. And I think, especially as we're getting older, the, you know, the moments tend to get more often, happen more often, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, it's really gratifying to see, you know, that other people are experiencing this, you know? 
This, uh, yeah. I don't want, it'd be a lonely journey if it was only me, you know? Oh my gosh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. Hey, Chris, thank you for, for uh, jumping in and, and uh, sharing. Sure. Yeah, great. Uh, Renata actually had a question too. She wrote it down and to be honest, I don't, I, Renata, I don't completely, I'm going to read it, but then I might ask for some clarification. You say, where is the difference between this non-dual few of being? Sorry, I don't know what that means. Uh, the center while feeling your own body as cause of what happens to you. Uh, Renata, I know you're, you're, you're <laughs> probably explain it better than me. <laughs> what do you want? What do you mean? <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, I'll try. No, okay. I, I think I've understood him as, or I've understood it as a shift, like you are in the center, take the center with you, and um, you are doing your movements or morphing when, when you um, put your legs up, then the, the, the floor will come to you. And this is clear. It's a, a great thing I'll have to try out. But then this, with this being grabbed in the arm there, I, either I misunderstood something or I, something like an alarm clock went off or an alarm, like I misunderstood it or I, I recognize I can misunderstood it as a kind of selfish, like, so um, I'm being grabbed like, or not yeah. grabbed, I can still move and I do this to my body and then it will uh, um, happen to them and because they are not in my center, they will lose their balance, which is of course true in Aikido in a way. Maybe I've not understood th there, I don't get the hint between this non-duality and this um the magic that happens in aikido yeah and whether this is really um hmm. yeah, something um, felt negative to me in this point i know and i understand sometimes uh because because of the way i ex explain this is really difficult this is the problem with uh using words is it can sound mm -hmm. very selfish you know what I'm talking about is all about, I do this, I do that, and that happens out there. Where's the harmony? Where's the unity? Uh, <laughs> so the thing is, is we're always looking for this sort of uh, direct, you know, this kind of direct with the other person harmony, this direct feeling of, okay, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. what about you? What about you? And it's, it's not just about me. And the thing is, you know, when I do uh, 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 exercises for my conscious and body, and what I'll do is I'll start off with some of the things that, you know, I've, uh, uh, I've got some tapes and I'll let them start off like this. Okay, uh, uh, without looking at, without moving at, where's your right hand? And all of a sudden I'll think, oh yeah, I can feel it, right? Okay, now where's your uh, forearm? Okay, there's my forearm. How about your hand and your forearm? And then suddenly you'll feel them both. You go, ah. And then you can get, so you can just be aware of the hand, but still be aware of, of the whole thing. It's like a wholeness. And you do this to your whole body. And at one point you're able to feel everything at once. And but it still has a body shape. Yeah. It's kind of a body shape, right? But then the body shape disappears and there's just this awareness of, of wholeness. And then there's no borders to that. So when someone grabs onto me and I'm only feeling myself, this is part of the training. This is the way I teach people. But it's for me, what happens at some point when I become conscious of myself, suddenly myself also includes their hand in their body. I don't try to move their body. But suddenly I feel this unity, but it's not particular to them. That unity or that mm -hmm. all-encompassing presence includes them, the whole room, and the entire everything around me. So there's no conflict there, but I can also, they can leave and it doesn't change anything. They can suddenly let go. You know, if I was dependent on their feeling, when they let go, I feel like there was a loss. But there's no loss. There's never a loss of, of a sense of, uh, of consciousness. So these are d developmental stages. But the first stage, it seems very, very selfish. And a lot of people go, well, this isn't, you're not caring about the other person. And what about encompassing their energy and harmonizing with them? But if you're in love with the universe, how can you not love everyone else? They're included, you know? Mm. This is, it's the greater love, you know? I often think, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I think about Jesus, you know, and his all-encompassing love. I remember in Jesus Christ Superstar, you know, Mary Magdalene singing this song, I don't know how to love him. 
how to touch mm -hmm. him, how to become like, I want him to be jealous. And, and, and but she, he totally loves her, but he loves everybody the same. I mean, of course, according to this yeah. greater love. And that greater mm -hmm. love, a lot of times, people feel, well, well what about me? <laughs> you know? Right. I, I feel mm -hmm. the greater love, but I want that special <laughs> love, you know? And I think sometimes, you know, working with a partner, you know, if you think this is not really denying them that love or that, that uh, all encompassing mm -hmm. universal connection, they're included, but it's not only them, you know? I'm loving them as much as I love everyone, if we want to use those words. I love them as much as I love everybody in the room that I'm practicing with at the same time. And that's the greater mm -hmm. harmony. So I don't know if that helped you answer your question. Yes, it helped. After all, with 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 the song I know and I've been thinking about a lot and 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 this, I've, actually now I've got it. It sounded also much less selfish this time to me. Yeah, okay, great. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Renata. Well, then we've kind of come to the end of our of our hour. Um, uh, maybe. Uh, just a few things I want to say is that um, I know you know Patrick, Patrick Cassidy. Yeah. You know, him and I are going to be doing uh, part two the next, uh, in, in the series next week, uh, not on Saturday, but on Sunday. Sunday, it will be the 12th of May, uh, same time. So uh, then, you know, I, I, know, I know you know Patrick, you, you guys have talked. I'm not sure if you've trained together. No, we haven't trained together, no. Because, you know, what him and I are doing and what you're doing and what a few other people that I know are doing is so much the same thing. And, um, you know, I, I just, that's one of the reasons I'm really looking forward to actually first feeling you and drop, falling into your, into your vortex or, or whatever they want to call it, uh, uh, doing some non delay keto together. But also, I think you'd enjoy practicing with Patrick. If you can join next week, uh, then we'll just get on together, the three of us, and riff. I'll, I'll step back and let you guys uh, take more. So uh, uh, you know, you're very welcome to join everybody else. If you can join that one, it's next Saturday. Excuse me, not Saturday, next Sunday, May uh, 12th at the same time, uh, 9 p.m. here in Israel, 8 p.m. in uh, in Central Europe. Uh, Dan, what did we start? 11 a.m. your time. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it'll be 3 p.m. on the East Coast. So anyways, you'll get an email about all of these upcoming calls. Please share them with your friends. Let them know if, they, if you think you know somebody who would be interested in this, uh, in this dialogue, this conversation, definitely let them in. This series, as I said, it's, it's um, uh, Brad Hendricks says 2 p.m. It was 2 p.m. for you in, uh, in the East Coast. Did I say 3 on, on the email? I'm sorry, that's why you showed up late. Yeah, Brad, I'm sorry, you can watch the, the replay. Uh, I hope a bunch of people don't jump in the call right now. I feel so embarrassed. Uh, so I got the times wrong for those on the East Coast. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, yeah, Aikido non-duality. Um, Dan and I are going to be teaching a, a full weekend seminar. It's Memorial Day weekend, uh, Friday. We start, I believe, Friday night, uh, 24th of May, 25th and 26th. We'll go for uh, two and a half days. Definitely come and join us. And, uh, and let's do some Aikido and non-duality practice together and let's see is there something there was something else I wanted to say this call has been recorded it will be posted in my blog hopefully by Monday and um, Dan would you like to to share any I, I did want to say and I, I want to say this for excuse me I'll get back to you in just a second Dan uh, for Bob and for uh, for Mandy who is on the call I will be actually in the Bay Area I'm gonna be teaching at Kayla's dojo on uh, the 21st Tuesday, the 21st of May, and then I'm going to be up practicing with Wendy Palmer uh, on the 23rd of May, and maybe even Richard's Dojo on the 24th. So I know Bob likes to practice around there too. So if you guys can join that, uh, definitely come and either train and let's practice together. Dan, Aikido non duality, you have any final words you'd like to share? No, I just want to thank everyone that uh, you know showed up for this. You know, and everybody got to you know participate. I tend to be a blabbermouth. I'm sorry, Miles, if I don't. Think. Not a, not at all. Not that's why we did nonsense sometimes. But uh, yeah, no, really, it's uh, you know again, to talking about it is difficult. You know, I hope that I get a chance to you know do hands on with if not at this coming seminar, but other places, so you can feel more of what I'm talking about. It's much easier to feel it than it is to talk about it. You know? mm. and, uh, Great. So uh, hopefully we can all, uh, and I know one of the things I do and I also I work is I learn things from people too, you know. You know, I don't know everything. I'm looking forward to training with Miles and, you know, picking up points from him. And these little, these other little things will sometimes push you through, you know. Yeah, so, I'm looking forward to it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Dan, thank you so very much and uh, looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Okay, bye-bye.
All right, everybody. Thanks for joining today. All the best. <laughs>